Hey. Sorry, I apologize for getting on a little late. I had some technical difficulties with a Zoom. Update. Yeah, I wonder, if that, I wonder if that's going around. I saw Drew get on and he got off and then uh, a guy named John got on and he got off too. Hopefully they come back. Well, I will be on for the duration. Um, so if you have any questions, um, we can go ahead and get started. Yeah. So, so you are with the, the Maker Made team then, Chris? Yes. Yes. Cool. I am um, one, one of the founders of, of Maker Made and um, like one of the, I guess the lead engineer behind all of the software. Um, so I do as much as I can to answer um, <laughs> any technical questions, anything with machine setup. Um, and if something if we need to escalate something outside of the meeting um we'll, we'll definitely get you taken care of um as yeah. quickly as possible cool well yeah man i just i got this uh sunday and i set it up and jumped right into it so i just thought i would get on here for my first time on one of the calls and just see what i could do to calibrate this thing in and get it as accurate as possible yeah so, absolutely um so as far as um, frame setup and everything goes, mm -hmm. um, are you running just the default 10 foot beam? Uh, yes. you, you don't have anything like one off that you've done like custom in your frame or anything like that. The only thing that I've got that's maybe a little weird is I went with an MDF waste board and it measures an inch over the four by eight. That is very, very common. Yeah. Um, so we actually, I, I, I prefer, uh, MDF over, mm -hmm. uh, over a plywood, um, waste board only cause it, it, it helps with a lot of mitigating the blowout on the backside when you do your through cuts. Yeah. Um, so heavy as uh, heck, but we thought it'd be a better uh, option. Oh yeah. man. A three quarter inch sheet of, of MDF will definitely, <laughs> have you evaluating some things <laughs> about your life when you're trying to do it alone. That's for sure. it's, it's even better when, when Lowe's and Home Depot decide that that's, that's upper rack material. Yeah, really. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see on your software side, um, which version of the Makerverse application are you currently running? Let me pull it up and see, I'm not actually sure. Okay, so if you downloaded from the website, if you went to makermade.com slash makerverse, mm -hmm. um, that version is 1.0.6. Um, if you went to makerverse.com, um, I believe the release version there is 1.1.2. Now, I will say 1.1.2 will require a firmware update. Um, on your control box. Gotcha. Uh, that is because 1.1.2, we have expanded some of the capabilities of um, the calibration process. Uh -huh. And we tried to do it as we, I mean, we tried as many ways as possible without changing the firmware of the, mm -hmm. of the control box because we know that it can be a pain. Mm -hmm. um to to update those but it, it just got to the point where we we just absolutely had to add some additional stuff to that control firmware to reliably provide those features um, well, so i do have the where... 1.0.6 okay so i will okay. tell you you can mm -hmm. run with 1.0.6 mm -hmm. uh and the base firmware that is on your control box um uh, we have Many, many users in the Facebook owners group that are still running 1.0.6 uh, with, with great accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, however, I will say 1.1.2 uh, does bring in some more kind of creature comforts um, mm -hmm. in the software that may make it easier to interact with the machine over time. <laughs> um, and that 1.1.2 is the base for our future software updates. So 
What's the uh, firmware? What's the firmware update look like? Do I just have to plug it in and, and hook everything up? And um, so it will require the use of the Arduino application at this oh, time. Okay. Um, one of the things, though, that we are working on for a future version of Makerverse, it'll probably be up, you know, January. Um, just because mm -hmm. we're, we're cleaning some stuff up here at the end of the year. Um, but a, a newer release of Makerverse um, will actually have the ability to flash that firmware within the Makerverse application and would not require you to download the Arduino software. Oh, so okay. in the event that you wanted to be kind of a, a holdout, um, you could get up and running with 1.0.6 and the existing firmware on your board and then wait for the future release of Makerverse that has the capability of updating the firmware on your control box. That is definitely something that you can do. Um, if you decide that you want to uh, make the jump to 1.1.2, uh, I can definitely go through the steps of, of flashing the firmware using the Arduino software as well. Um, definitely. I mean, is there, are there benefits to, to convey in terms of accuracy of cuts or is it, is it just an interface? It, it is more user friendly by way of giving you feedback on what you can do to achieve better accuracy. Mm -hmm. So it is um, more, more intuitive um mm -hmm. by means of we calibrate off of the edge um mm -hmm. and the and the software has a little bit more automation in there so i would i i have seen users that were on 1.0.6 make the jump to 1.1.2 and mm -hmm. and and said that they have a increase in accuracy um on their cuts um do you guys have a, a write-up for that firmware update process? Uh, we do. So let me let me actually pull up and share my screen here. All righty. So, oh, host. Apparently, I am not the host of my own meeting. <laughs> um, let, me, let me send a message. Um, So in the meantime, I will drop this link in chat um, so you can so you can see what I am looking at. So on the on the machine on the software itself. So there's there's two different uh, Maslow. Uh, standards or variants there is the there's one that uses the arduino mega which mm -hmm. is the kind of the the classic uh maslow kit um mm -hmm. so on our on our site we have the jumpstart kit that would be considered a classic maslow um and then the m2 which uses is based off of an arduino do um microcontroller um, so if you have an m2 it would be based on the Arduino Do. So if you click on the Arduino Do link 
there. Mm -hmm. um, that will take you uh, to the GitHub link that has, um, that is the firmware itself. And then mm -hmm. this is where you will see um, some of the update instructions. Um, so it'll show you, you know, opening the, the INO file, um, choosing your Arduino board. Um, and so what I can, if you have the opportunity, um, let me get you a link for that Arduino software. Um, and then we might be able to just do a kind of like a follow along. And if, if I can get this screen sharing enabled, then I can, uh, I can just walk you through it if that works. Yeah, we can do that now. I, I needed, you said I needed to download some Arduino interface software though. Yep. So I just dropped the, the link to Arduino uh, in the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and let you get that downloaded. And then while we wait on screen share and everything, I'm just going to see if anyone else uh, in, the, in the group here has any, any questions um, outside of this topic. Anybody? I mean, I got some more questions if uh, nobody else. Yeah, is sorry. Uh, I just wanted to make sure nobody else did. I, I'm, I'm having a little bit of a problem with calibration. Okay. Uh, I've, uh, I must have measured the distance between the gears 12 times and the, uh, and the offset uh, 12 times as well. And I, I seem to be running into um, something where I don't know if I should just reset everything and start from the beginning because uh, I tried to get it within about four or five millimeters on the X and Y and then do the uh, calibration wizard, the settings down there. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be still g becoming uh, askew a little bit. Like um, I'm cutting at an angle. Um, okay. So I'll say the angle cuts are will will not be related to your x and y scaling because those are always in the assumption that you know left and right are are left and right and up and down is up and down um so when whenever you see any kind of skewing or a dip in there um there are three major things that that i have people check um the first and just absolute easiest thing to check is making sure that your waste surface and your top beam are in fact parallel with each other. Um, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, and obviously none of these things are said with the, hey, I know what is wrong, what's wrong, you did this. This is just, these are like those quick hit items that you can go through, kind of check yes or no, move on to the next thing. Um, so first and easiest thing to check um, is that, making sure the top beam and the, the waste surface are, are in fact parallel with each other. Um, if, if they are, the next thing that you can check that is also an easy one, is making sure that your, your waste board surface or your cut surface is in fact flat. Obviously, um, sheet goods are sold under the assumption that they are flat, but they rarely are. Um, an easy way to check that is any kind of straight edge. It doesn't have to be a level if you have, you know, you know obviously, it's not like a two by four or something else that could be skewed. But if you have like a large ruler or something that spans, I would say, you know, three feet is a, is a good, good way to, to tell. And then just kind of slide that across the surface um, vertically as well as, um, you know, diagonal, you know, just different directions just to make sure that you do have um, a flat surface. Um, typically, 
if you have a, a crown or a concave in the center of your, of your waist surface, then that would cause some skewing or arcing to your horizontal line. Um, and then, so those are physical things that you can check with just the frame construction itself that would have an impact on, skew, you know, rotating or skewing your cut. Out, after those things are, are, are good and, and, and known to not be the issue, the, um, the next things as far as calibration that could have a, a direct you know, causality there would be your distance between motors measurement and your motor offset measurement, which is the distance from your motors to the top of your wasteboard. Um, those two measurements are very key in a lot of the assumptions that the machine it makes. Um, because we are, um, we're, we're consistently calculating the peak of a triangle uh, when, when, we're, when we're doing sled position. So if, if any of those values are off, then it, it can kind of modify the, the actual location of the sled compared to you know, the assumed location based on those, those values. So those would be four kind of quick things that you can run like a sanity check on uh, before you kind of advance in making any, uh, any changes to calibration settings or even like resetting back to factory defaults. Because if, if, if any of those four things are off, even, even resetting your board and starting over, you're, you're gonna end up back at the same point that you are right now. Okay. Okay, uh, and, and uh, just because I'm, I'm curious, it, it, it can, a, a small dip or, or crown in the, uh, the backing board, I mean, this is a, this is like, you know, a, probably seven or eight degrees off. And that's probably pretty common with that. Yes. Um, and, and that, so that can cause an issue because, because the mechanics of the machine, we do not have a suspended gantry um, like, like most tabletop CNC's. So mm -hmm. the, the actual distance of travel is physically sliding across the surface of that waste wasteboard. So if you have a if you have a dip or a bow, visually from left to right, you see that span, but there's 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 actually more distance um, because of that that dip or the crown. And so the sled is still sliding across that surface and and making that calculation. Uh, but it didn't actually move as far from left to right as you were expecting it to because it was compensating for that that bow in the waist surface. Okay. Um, well, I'll uh, start there. I, I, you know, I, um, yeah, I don't know. I, it, do you suggest maybe putting a couple extra screws in the backer board um, along the middle supports? Yeah, no, like abs absolutely. A absolutely, and we we are working on our um, our documentation. Uh, I, I know that 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 sounds just like a terrible cop out, um, <laughs> but a, a lot of a lot of our documentation has been so heavily focused on like the kit and the software and the usage of the machine that some of the some of like the the basic. Not, not basic, but some of like the expectations of the frame uh, have not been, you know, properly communicated. And so I apologize for that. We are working on the, the documentation. Um, one, one thing I can just say is you will see, let, or I can't guarantee, but 
in my experience, I have seen less warping and bows when using MDF as a um, waste surface than when using um, like like a even a three quarter inch sheet apply. Um, but yeah, you can you can kind of true it up, and then if if you need to run another screw or if you need another brace on the backside, um, you can you can do pretty much whatever is necessary uh, in that scenario. I would say though, anytime that you are running screws into the face of your waste surface where you, you know a cut path could be, um, try to counter bore that screw. You yeah, know, same, at least, same at least real deep. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll see so, what I have. I'm, I'm using MDF, so maybe, I mean, I don't know, maybe I just got a bad board and if I can't see it, you know, just without. Yeah, and it's it. that, so are you using the wall mounts or are you, or did you build the wooden frame? I'm using the wall mounts, so I've got it, yeah. Okay, yeah, so I mean, the wall mounts there, I guess that there is an opportunity to introduce some, some warping. Um, and and obviously two by fours are, are not known for for perfection either yeah um, the good news is it's going to be a easier fix than doing a bunch of stuff in in the software um just just because it, it's kind of one of those physical things and then once you have it done um you you won't run into issues caused by that uh, I anymore um, but, but obviously there is the, the task itself. So I, I apologize, um, for that. Um, but it is a solvable problem and we can definitely get you to a higher accuracy than the, the original kind of five millimeter target that, that you had set out. Okay. Well, I'll drop some more screws and see, uh, see if that works. Perfect. Also, I would say if, if any of you are not um, members of the Facebook owners group, um, there's, there's quite a bit of information um, and, and other users that are extremely active and helpful on there. Um, there's, there's a guy like Mike Garza, um, Joe Johnson. Um, there's, there's, there are definitely some people that we can pair you up with and you, you'll get um, a lot more instantaneous feedback, obviously, than waiting for these Thursday calls. Let's see. Let's see if they gave me the ability to. Nope. Still no, no sharing here. Hey, uh, Chris, I got another question about the top beam. Yes, sir. As you alluded, two by fours are not known to be perfectly straight or square and mine certainly has quite a bit of bow in it. Is that something I should expect to affect accuracy of my cuts? So the top beam is unique in that the actual span of the top beam doesn't have a lot of major impact to the cut itself. It's mm -hmm. really the position. Of you. Now you want a straight one so that it doesn't have, it doesn't introduce any kind of like canting to your motors you want them to be you want that motor pl plate to be flat um, like and but a a slight bow like in the outward or inward direction um, will not have as as much of an issue a impact uh, because there's the sled itself is not riding on that surface you would just want to make sure that you have um, accurate measurements from motor to motor for for your calibration and uh for that motor offset too I, i'm just a, a probably half an inch under the 18 inch recommended top cut surface um i mean is that is it is 18 exactly where you want it or do you want more than 18 inches how, how important is that also for the accuracy let's see um you're a half inch under and, and keep in mind, my MDF board is an inch over four inches high. So I don't know if that Correct. helps 
better or anything like that. So, yeah, I mean, that's only, that's 12, 12 millimeters. That's, you should be fine. Where you'll see people that'll struggle is when they're at like 425 or 430 millimeters. Um, and then that's, that, that's kind of pushing the, those limits. And really what that distance, that motor offset is so that the chain angle can accurately get you to the upper corners of, of, the, uh, of the waste surface. But I would say um, 18, 18 inches isn't gonna be too bad because that's still putting you, you're still over 450 at that. I mean, if I, if I raised that up to 19 or 20 inches, would that make things even more accurate? Or is that just kind of me spinning my wheels for no good good uh, result? But potentially, but I would say if you're on 1.0.6, I would say you could probably gain more accuracy on a firmware update in a 1.1.2 than that extra inch on your 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 gap because I'm I'm personally running um, 470 millimeter motor offset which is 18 and a half inches um, mm -hmm. and and I get um, good accuracy um, we have we I know of a user that's at like 447 millimeters and mm -hmm. they're seeing um, good accuracy so yeah I think you you fall in that in that threshold where, where you should be fine. Um, and then if you, if you do run into issues, um, I've found that it is easier to lower your waist surface than raise your top beam. Well, and, and, and I guess that ties into my other question since I have the MDF, which is an inch over I mean, is it better to lie to the program and tell it, tell it that it's only a four by eight cutting surface or, or put the actual direct measurements in? So ultimately we, we want to know what the, what your waste surface is um, because mm -hmm. of being able for the machine to know like what, what the ends are. So that, that scaling um, value for X and Y is based off of those dimensions um, so you can lie to it if you like but you i would say if if you're going to if you're going to lie to it as far as your dimensions i would snap a chalk line on mm -hmm. my waist surface mm -hmm. so that you have a visual reminder of hey i'm actually calibrating the machine to this line and not the yeah. edge of the waist surface okay. all right yeah, because right now I've told it the actual exact dimensions, but when I set my home, I I went down. I did the dead center of the board. Mm -hmm. um, but when I went down, I only set it to two feet instead of two feet and half an inch. I don't know if that's also gotcha. worth me. Okay, so you've actually calibrated on, did you measure that from the top or the bottom of the waste surface? Uh, from the top, I assume that was the most important direction. Okay. So you you have calibrated to the to the upper half of the mm -hmm. of the waste surface. That's right. Um, I would say if you were concerned about accuracy and that distance between and that motor offset, um, changing that center point to a measurement off the bottom of the waste surface okay. would would compensate for that inch. Okay, that's a good point. And then I guess my other kind of new guy question is I followed the written instructions on how to set up the chain on the top board. Um, and then I also received in my bag A some longer nails with some kind of 3D printed long washers. And in the calibration video, I noticed that those were kind of set up different than the instructions. Um, it almost looked like and that, that maybe this was because it was Drew's shorter board, perhaps. Um, but, but right uh, now I have, 
I have my end link nailed into the board an inch from the top and six inches from the outside. But in the in the video I saw with Drew calibrating his, he had looked like his end link nailed almost an inch or two from the end of the board and then had them uh, wrapped over these kind of washers uh, with a nail yeah. through them. So, so Drew's machine is not reflective of a, a standard assembly okay. uh, be, because he's having to do some, some kind of some chain compensation because he's right. running such a smaller frame. So I would not, I would not um, worry about that. Okay. I, I wasn't worried until I realized I had those parts given to me, but I guess that's in case I wanted to do a four by four or six by four machine or something. Correct. We're, we're trying to um, take into account all of the different um, potential settings that a user would want to do. Um, and, and kind of fix that. There we go. We got an M2. Got an M2 on the line. <laughs> yeah, let me just put it to sleep. All right. Um, any other questions? Uh, and Clay, we are we are definitely going to circle back on the software thing. I don't want you to think that I uh, have abandoned you. I'm hoping. <laughs> Hoping I can get my screen sharing online uh, mm -hmm. so that so that we can uh, do it together. Yeah, no problem. Hi guys, I just uh, joined the meeting. Vince Bachman here. Um, question base. I'm, are you guys able to hear me? Okay. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I I actually called last week in and um, pretty new to the the M two. Uh, my buddy and I are building it together and we initially built it uh, with the, the kind of easel frame and weren't getting super great results. So we kind of went back to the, the drawing board and, and followed the complete wall mount uh, version recommended in the M2 instructions. So we've got it all mounted. Uh, everything's, you know, squared up, level, looking really, looking really solid. But then we also you know, found out there was some beta software available and kind of went down that rabbit hole, flashed our, flashed our Arduino with the new firmware. And, um, maybe that was a problem. Now we're not communicating to the motors at all. Um, it, the IDE environment definitely allowed us to, to upload the, the new firmware to the Arduino. Um, but now the Makerverse, the new Makerverse, um, I guess beta, won't communicate with the Arduino or the motors. And I was curious if that's been a problem, uh, if you'd recommend just flashing it back to the original uh, firm firmware and sticking with the stable release on your website at this point. I think we can get you sorted out. Okay. Um, are you on uh, Windows or Mac? Windows. 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 Okay. Um, is there a possibility that the Arduino software is still open on your computer? Unfortunately, the machine is at his place and I'm, I'm calling from-, um, from Oh, okay. Computer. No, that's quite all right. So I can give you a couple um, uh, things to check. Okay, um, okay, great. Let me grab a sheet of paper here. Let's okay. Write down. Okay, excellent. Yeah, this is good. So the Arduino software is extremely greedy in that okay. anytime it sees an Arduino, it believes that it belongs to it and solely okay. it. So if the Arduino software is still running, even though you've completed that firmware update, it's mm -hmm. actually gonna maintain connection with your board, which will prevent okay. the Makerverse application from initiating a connection. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's, the, that's like the quick um, check um, okay. to, to start with. Um, second is to make sure that you do not have the older version of Makerverse running in the background or anything like that. 
Okay. Um, that will that will actually um, initiate the same uh, error. Okay. Um, a third thing that you can check is um, making sure that the power connector is is actually is plugged into your your top shield okay. um, because the Arduino software itself um, will update the firmware without that power connector being connected um, because it's only worried about that microprocessor that holds okay. the firmware. But the yeah. Makerverse application itself needs to talk to that motor controller. And if it doesn't have that, that external power supply connected to it, um, then it, it, it does not um, show up to the Makerverse application. Okay. Um, the other thing would be uh, ensuring that you have the 38400 baud rate um, when, when making the connection. Um, if, if it's anything other than 38400, um, it, it'll just say there's, there's nothing there. Right. So it's, so all of those steps, I think we went through, um, it's, it's interesting on, we had two computers actually as well. Uh, and one computer would open the maker base maker verse software, mm -hmm. um, no problem. And it looked like it was stepping through the, the kind of, uh, calibrations sequence. And, but then, yeah, like when we attempted to unlock and move the motors, obviously nothing was happening. On that machine though, it was kind of strange. And maybe this has to do with the Arduino software being open and us not even realizing that it wouldn't see the, um, like, no, actually, let me re refresh this. The, within the Arduino IDE software, it wouldn't see the actual Arduino port on that computer. Um, so I'm not sure. Okay. I feel like I'm potentially missing one one thing somewhere. Whereas on the other computer, it would see the see the port and communicate with the Arduino no problem. But the Makerverse software would would not open and just gave a an error even though it was logged in. Oh, so the Makerverse software itself would not launch. On um, on um, yeah. So we were having kind of like dueling uh, errors on different machines. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like on one of the computers, you, you may have had some conflicting software. So okay. in the same fashion that Makerverse cannot see the board if Arduino is open, Arduino cannot see the board if Makerverse was open first. Got it. Um, they, so they will actually, they'll have just kind of like a custody battle over that, over that controller. Okay. Well, that's good. I mean, and we're, we're definitely not frustrated at this point. We just... Now we knew kind of diving down the rabbit hole of the beta software we might run yep. into some issues. Now or the other thing that I will say, and and this is one of the things that we're definitely um, working um, diligently to eliminate from being a problem. <laughs> um, the the do board itself is not natively part of the Arduino software. So if you just download the Arduino software and mm -hmm. connect the, and connect the control box, it actually, it doesn't know what it is. Um, right. So the, the do itself is a, is a, is a, this, a SAM board. Um, and you have to, you have to download, uh, you have to do like an extension update in the Arduino software to have support for that board. Um, and, and so maybe that computer, that Arduino software might not have had that, that SAM extension yeah. added. We, we actually went, the way we got it to work uh, initially is we went through Arduino Create, which that environment um, natively recognized. Okay. The they, they actually had the, the board control, I think, built into it. I don't know if you played around with the, the create um, kind of online. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, okay. the web editor. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So it seemed like they had. 
yeah. basically everything kind of you, you can do you can do that and i know um i personally have experienced some issues when you so the arduino software itself there's the web editor mm -hmm. there's the downloadable software mm -hmm. and then for windows users they actually have the arduino software as part of the um the windows 10 um marketplace okay um the windows 10 marketplace version of the arduino software has has not been um very helpful for me um, I've, I've run into issues with that so i would say I, I don't know that it is updated as frequently as the the web download okay. um, so I, I would say to anyone that is going to kind of take on the firmware update before we have that feature as a native um, process in Makerverse, um, definitely download the software directly from Arduino. Um, the reason the, the web version, uh, it works. Um, we have we have tested it and it, it does work on the firmware update. Uh, it's it's just that uh, fear of you know a spotty internet connection or something causing an issue. Okay, um, gotcha. so that's gotcha. there's there's nothing saying hey if you use the web version it's not going to work. It's mm -hmm. it's just my personal paranoia of using web based applications <laughs> to to flash you know, sure. hardware. Sure. And I guess, I guess the last question is, um, I, as a fairly new user to Ar Arduino in the programming environment, um, is there a risk of like bricking the board if it doesn't complete a firmware up update? There is there a risk? Yes. Are okay. you in a position to the, the way this is the way that that, that risk becomes reality is mm -hmm. if, if, at any time before you see an error mm -hmm. or a success message, if at any time before that point um, you yank the USB cable, then you could put the control, the Arduino, into a state where um, it's not easily recovered. Gotcha. Um, and, and then at that point, it's it's not bricked in a state that it's hey this is this is trash now but it's mm -hmm. it's in a point where the bootloader needs to be reinstalled um okay. and that that requires a completely different process that is documented online but it 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 sucks i'll just say <laughs> at that point like it is it it's one of those things where like you, you know i'm I'm interacting with these Arduino boards on a daily basis and it frustrates me doing bootloaders. <laughs> so that it, it's just not a very streamlined because it's, you either have to have this like fancy $500 box that plugs into your Arduino uh -huh. or you, or you have to have another Arduino that does work. And then gotcha. it copies its bootloader to the, the bad board. Um, so it, it, it's, it's definitely a cumbersome process. That, that's where you'll see a lot of the frustration people have in like the 3D printing community where they're mm -hmm. like, yeah, I got this, I got this printer, but it doesn't come factory with a bootloader. You know, I hate these guys because it does require some additional hardware just to get the bootloader uh, on there. If, if you have any doubt whatsoever that you have, um, you know, bricked or put your control box in a state that is unrecoverable to you, mm -hmm. definitely let us know. We'll get a warranty replacement out to you and we'll just get that box back from you. Uh, okay. And then we can write some diagnostics I don't, on it. I, I definitely appreciate that. I, I don't feel like we're at that point right now, just, just because it was communicating with the Arduino last night, like we definitely um, got a bunch of success messages. No, uh, we had a few errors at the beginning, but we worked past that. So I, I think we're kind of at that point where 
Well, we've dove, dove down the rabbit hole. Um, we've got a lot of a lot of things to think about, and I I think finally my last question, if I, if this is still okay, I'm not trying to monopolize the time here. Um, on the M2 setup, we there's an instruction. This is this is the hardware, the actual nails, um, their location was a little confusing. Like in all the images online and even in the instructional. Um, documentation. It looks like the nails are placed, so it says six inches from the edge of the board, but all the images kind of look like they're more like six inches from the edge of the end of the motor. And so I just was curious uh, if you had any guidance there. And I don't um, know if I share my screen. I could show you our setup. Yeah, I'm a, I'm actually working on getting these. Uh, I think I figured out. Oh. And it, it's okay if not. It, it's basically a, a, a difference between really six inches is what we've been talking. So the motor itself seems to be about, if I'm remembering correctly, just, just under six inches, maybe five inches in length. So it's kind of a difference between the nail being placed at six inches from the edge of the board or 11 inches from the edge of the board. I, it's from the, it's, yeah, it's from the end of the board. Okay, yes. here, here we yes. go. I think I have figured out sharing. I need options, guys. All right, here we go. Meeting settings. It is going to make me do it from my computer. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this real fast. Okay. I am going to Oh there. Yes, I did it. <laughs> there we go. That is okay. Let's see. Oh, I can share now. Okay, all of you should be able to share. So if you can share your screen, then yeah. I can. All righty. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the end link of your, yep, that looks yeah. good. So, okay, that is good. Okay, great. Yes. That's, yeah, I think that was the question. I just, it felt like a lot more tension on the spring than when we had the, the setup with the, the easel kind of setup versus. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and this okay. is, that that is to, in an effort to give you that that constant tension. Gotcha. Um, okay. So yeah. that, so that that chain slack never, never drops down. Um, and then the nail placement, the way that you can test that nail placement. Mm-hmm is if you dry, just slowly jog your machine to like the upper right hand corner. Okay. Um, and then just make sure that your drive chain doesn't come in contact with that nail. Perfect. No, that, that's excellent. Cool. Um, yeah. All right. No, that, that's great. I'm, I'm excited to, to play with some of these uh, tips that you've, you've given us today. Hey, Chris, this is Mike. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Hey, um, when, uh, um, um, hello again. <laughs> I've been on a few of these. Um, just a general um, thought observation. When I'm looking at um, that screenshot that you just had up, the picture, um, it reminds me, and I think you touched on it a little bit uh, earlier on, um, that I've been meaning to ask, are, it, it seems like what I think I'm hearing, and you, sa you said earlier that um, what, what 
what we're really doing in the absence of a gantry is we're continuously calculating um, like the peak, the point of a triangle um, that is, you know, the, the bit in the router. Um, if you look at the chains, uh, the chain as the three legs, right? And that the problem, I mean, the worst case um, accuracy problem is in the upper corners where, um, uh, well, anyway, I can't think of what the physics or geometry <laughs> problem is you're solving right there in those upper areas. But you, you mentioned that it would be a lot easier to lower the, uh, um, working like waste board than to raise the um, uh, top bar. Yes. So looking at the picture of what what the what people are building, uh, the standard design, I'm thinking, why are we wasting a foot at the bottom of our design? Um, why not just bring the the whole board down? Uh, closer to the floor? Um, so that can be done. Uh, uh, so part of it is just for, you know, ergonomics of, of use so that you're not having to like bend over to pull, you know, cut pieces off of, off of the machine. Um, and then the other part is because of the diameter of the sled, uh, we have to maintain, you know, roughly 10 inches off of the, off of the surface of the floor so that so that you can have a little bit of, of a overlap, but there by by all means you can definitely lower um, your waist surface to okay. whatever whatever height um, works for you. Uh, yep. the The biggest thing is when you when you start to play with that, just making sure that you are maintaining um, that surface angle. Yeah, um, yeah. in a good way, uh, angle. Yep. yes, sir. In a, a good way for, for people to test that is if, if you think that you're a little too close to, um, to the, uh, top beam, you can do a couple things. Um, you can lie to the software. Obviously it's not best practice to lie to the software. Uh, because the, you know, obviously the software is assuming that all of those numbers are in fact correct. Um, but if, if you go in and you say, Hey, you know, I think I need to move my, my top beam up or my waste board down, you can make that, that assumption and say, okay, I need to add an inch and you can just, add that inch to your motor offset calculation. Um, and then it will, it'll give you a lower center point, but then you'll be able to test that accuracy. It'll say, okay, Hey, I know I moved, I know I moved in it. I know I, I moved an inch down, uh, in the software, which is going to move my home down on my waist surface. So it's not going to be perfectly centered, but, I will be able to, I, you know, if this hypothesis is true, I should be able to make a more accurate square cut with this, this lower center point that I have created in the software and say, all right, I'm going to do a 500 by 500 millimeter um, square, which, you know, obviously adding that digital inch offset would not run you in the risk of running off the edges of any other board. Um, and then I'm gonna cut this square. Hey, my problems are gone. Now I know that I need to just, I just need to move my waist surface down that inch. Uh, but it, it gives you a way to, to kind of test some of these physical changes uh, before actually doing it and saves you the frustration of saying, okay, hey, you know, I took my whole machine apart I took out all these screws, I moved my waist surface and it didn't do anything for me. Um, can I, how, how can I get that hour of my life back? Um, so this, this is just kind of like a quick way that you can simulate a physical change in the software to, to see if 
you know, the observed results are favorable. Awesome. Hey, um, um, can I share my screen to just to show you a picture that make will make it easier to talk? Absolutely. Let's see if I can do this. Share. Okay. So just for the purpose, so if you're seeing that, I'm just it's a picture of regular old M2 sled, right? Yep. Okay. So what I've noticed is as I'm trying to get more uh, usage out of the bottom of the wasteboard, those bricks are actually the limiting factor. Um, they hang down below mm. the, the bottom of the circle of the sled. Yep. Um, the other thing that they limit is, or you know, effect that they're having is if the sled comes close to the edge of your workpiece, the center of gravity um, is going to shift over to the right as, <laughs> as that, um, I mean, if you're going to the right, as that brick on the right is hanging further over the edge, right? So yes, I can see there's two things going on. You're spreading out the weight over a wider area, which is maybe a good thing but you're also uh, dangling it out there when you get to the Correct. edge. And, I'm, and what I was thinking is if I knew what weight I was shooting for as, you know, an optimum weight, you know, maybe getting a, um, you know, like a, whatever, an exercise gym weight mm -hmm. and attaching it to the board where, you know, it's more dense and I can get it closer to that circle and not be hanging out as far. Um, Those that's that as definitely uh, that is a, a great assessment and it is something that you can do. So okay. your your target um, would be to be around 25 pounds with with the weight of the router on on your sled um, for 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 total total you know operational weight. The reasoning for the bricks is in a kit capacity. Um, this is a very easy way um, to add weight uh, without, you know, you know, us either selling weight and then taking on, you know, the, the shipping, co shipping cost of sending you, you know, eight pounds of just mass is, is definitely going to be noticeable. Um, and those bricks, uh, I think, I think I paid like 62 cents a piece for mine at Home Depot. Um, so part of it is just ease of access um, to the kits without having a noticeable impact to the, the end cost to the user. Um, mm -hmm. So you are definitely more than welcome to interchange those, those weights for, for anything that you may find that weighs, you know, the, the proper amount um, and mount it in, in whatever fashion. That, that you see fit. It looks like though that there's some thought or design into where they're located and how they're oriented. Like when I look at this picture, it's almost like the weight on the left is in line with the chain yes. uh, coming up from the right. So the, the idea is kind of the statics behind it is that if, if that brick is in line with the, the opposing chain, um, then we are putting our kind of our, our downward force um, kind of properly uh, centered because ultimately this, the sled is, is allowed to rotate freely on the chains. So we're just trying to extend those lines from the chain across the sled and, and to the weight to, to have it. Because what you what you run into is when you put the weight dead center at the bottom of the sled, you it gives you the assumption that okay, here you go, my weight is centered, uh, gravity is pulling it down, everything is fine. Um, but when you add the motion of the sled uh, along with the rotation of the bit itself you'll see that your, your sled kind of walks at time. 
at times where it'll it'll rotate and then that then that that mass is no longer you know properly centered at the at the bottom so by having these at like that lower third uh, it kind of mitigates some of that and then obviously with the m2 now that we have the z-axis um, there's not a lot of room to place anything in the in the center portion of the sled anyway uh, but yeah if you if you we we have some some users will uh, drill a hole in that that side that side piece of aluminum of the z-axis um, and then run a bolt through there and then hang um, some uh, I think it's like 2.5 pound, just like barbell weights on there and, and then be fine. Uh, it, it's all in your desire to kind of push the kit further into your use case. Uh, another thing that, that uh, people have done too is, is just adding almost like a skirt to the edge, outer boundaries of their, of their surface so that they don't run into kind of that overhang scenario that you spoke of. Cool. Thanks. I've got a, like a cheap five pound cap Olympic barbell here and it almost it has these kind of easy grip things on the edges that almost would fit right over the screws with it that are holding the brick in place actually. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely, um, like I said, it, you know, in general, you're, you're just, the target is that that 25 pound mm -hmm. um, total sled weight. Um, there are some other options out there. I know there's a there's a vendor that sells a um, they made a sled out of out of I think it's steel, um, and and that works. Uh, obviously, it's it, they don't have the whole alignments for the M2, um, but it it is available on some of the older Maslows. Um, it works. The, the struggle that we've had with, with testing metal, um, metal sleds is, um, just that, that friction it's sliding across, you know, especially in this picture, uh, it looks like they're cutting, um, some white melamine, um, you know, the potential marring of your, your cut material when sliding a piece of steel, you know, if it gets any kind of scratch or nick or anything in the sled, then, then that can, you know, turn into a uh, negative impact to your, to your cut. So that's where we've kind of stuck with wood. Um, that and it's, it's, it's a lot more easier to manipulate and have the end user turn it into what they want it to be. So like in this picture right here where, where your, your sled is now protruding to the left of the melamine, if you were to have a similar surface um, like you have uh, beneath it there um, to the left of the melamine, uh, that would kind of counteract that, that bit walk that you would see uh, where the sled is, is kind of stepping off of the melamine. Yeah, that, that's the challenge. That's why uh, there's a sheet below it. Um, but I was pushing the limits on this one. And um, I just wanted to point out that the way I'm supporting the sheet below it, you see in the bottom right, there's a uh, bench dog, a stainless um, 20 millimeter um, cylinder that pokes through into mm -hmm. the wasteboard. And um, I ended up with a little indentation at that bottom corner. It hasn't cut it yet. This is actually a video, but I don't want to waste everyone's time getting to that point. But I ended up, the bottom right corner was supposed to be squared, like the top right corner that you see in the white melamine. Um, but it ended up um, with a, say, a 45 degree um, uh, cut a uh, cut off of that corner and I could not figure out why until I realized oh my god when I wasn't looking the brick uh um bottomed out and hit the bench dog and that just you know it, it guided the m2 sled up off that corner <laughs>
Um, so anyway, so you can see I've been playing around with better ways to support my my waste foam and etc. But that that was where my idea came from. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I see you have a kind of a grid outlined on your waste surface there. Are those screws or those holes or what what is that? Um yeah and and um one of the earlier uh Thursday sessions I showed this um uh, so if you look back you can see the actual um things used to make it and whatnot but what it is is it's a 96 millimeter grid of three millimeter holes um and uh it, it's it's a standard thing that woodworkers use and um once you're once you're um once you're in this standard uh, you got these three millimeter holes, then you can go and you can uh, bore out um, 20 millimeter holes on that grid and then use standard what they call bench dogs um, mm -hmm. to support work pieces and get a, you know, an always perfect, um, you know, uh, straight right angle um, grid, uh, which is, you know, like my biggest, you know, absolutely fear from my old days of trying to do something before i you know got serious is always having things being a little out of uh perfect you know square absolutely um, this way you're, you're always perfectly square uh you know as close to cnc perfect as you can get oh yeah so a trick that i use and we're we're kind of we're still testing it out just to see if it's one, is this a product that people want? Or two, is this just a thing that I came up with that helps me? Um, but on, so on my waste surface, what I have is I have a similar grid um, that, that I have drawn out. Um, my squares are a little bit larger, um, just, just to fit the use case. And then what I did in, in my grid is I, I drilled them out to, I believe, eight millimeters. And I have aluminum threaded inserts that I have screwed into all of those holes. And then at that point, instead of using like a bench dog, I have, um, they make uh, plastic screws for, for CNC applications that oh, I can, beautiful. I can take, you know, like this support material like you have, um, and I can drill, I have some holes in it. It's kind of like a pattern jig almost. And then I can set it and I can mount it to my waist surface with those plastic screws um, and then kind of use like, uh, like I have some like cam locking clamps that I've made in various thicknesses. Um, so then I can actually lock a piece down to my, to my waist surface and then everything is the same thickness. So the sled will slide all around it. And then it uses those plastic screws and aluminum um, threaded insert. So in the event that the bit were to ever kiss any of those, it's, it's not going to create, you know, this, this crazy nightmare in the, in the garage. Uh, but it'll, yeah, so, it'll. Hey, hey, so the, the uh, uh, finished carpentry, cabinet making, woodworking people, uh, that YouTubers, uh, um, just came up with just shipped and i and i've got um i've got a bunch of them a something that sounds very very much like what you just described where you see my my stainless bench dog sticking sticking out the bottom right mm -hmm. um i have um flush that would go in from underneath um with a ch um like a the opposite of a chamfer <laughs> that sticks out um and then a and so then they will they will sit flush and then have a quarter twenty um, thread uh, hole that you could screw a bolt into. Now, if the um, plastic bolt you just described happens to be quarter twenty, oh my God, I want one. I want to know where I get them. Oh, absolutely. Um, so mine these are more like wood screw sizes, but um, you could definitely three D print. Uh, quarter 20 bolt and then just have PLA 
Uh, obviously, I don't know if you have a 3D printer or not. Um, I do. But, but, but that that would be a, um, a great use of that. And then you would have, you know, replenishable consumables on hand. Fantastic. I've been looking for a reason to put this darn um, Creality uh, 10S Pro V2 <laughs> together and get it working. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I need to make a bolt. <laughs> um, so if we don't have make any a other... cent bolt. There you go. <laughs> All right. Um, if we don't have any other uh, machine-specific questions i uh, was gonna jump over to just doing a quick screen share of how to use the arduino application to do the m2 firmware update um, that supports the 1.1.2 um, makerverse um, but i want to want to make sure that i have other any other machine uh, questions addressed first I don't have a machine question. My name's John, uh, but if it's all right, if I could ask, I hope it's a quick question. Uh, it's late where I am and would love to, to know. I, I just bought one, bought my Maslow. I have not installed it. I haven't done anything yet, um, but I'm looking to understand what the software is for creating and designing things that you would recommend for a entry level new person on a Mac. Absolutely. Okay. So on a Mac, what is your, so the fastest way to get going, uh, obviously you can use, you know, DXFs and, and, and CAD specific um, file types to run your cuts. The absolute fastest way to get going is SVGs. Um, so if you have any, any experience with um, like Adobe software, anything like that, um, Illustrator is the way to go. Obviously, that is an expense, especially the way they change their licensing model. I think it's like $100 a year now to have Illustrator. Yeah. Um, Inkscape is a free version, uh, a free application. Uh, one thing you'll run into with Inkscape, though, is they're, they're behind a little bit on some of their Mac support. Um, so I know Mac. Guy. That's good. I'm a Mac guy who just went through what you're um, about to go through. Um, maybe my uh, um, maybe my experience is a, is a little skewed because of my application, but I was looking for that same answer. But my in my situation, I was already all in on SketchUp, and so I was, what I was trying to do is take my SketchUp designs and make templates. Um, like you're see, you saw in my photo. So by any chance, if you're a SketchUp guy, then the answer is you need to export your patterns from SketchUp um, as SVGs, which means you get you need to get a plugin um, called Faber um, export to SVG. And then the trick is make sure that you're using the Adobe Illustrator 96 DPI standard not um, the VCARV um, 90 DPI standard because uh, SVG is, is really not intended for this purpose. Um, so you've got to get from, from dots to um, inches and, you know, and then if you're like me working in millimeters, that all ends up actually being, being uh, in millimeters. And then uh, from there, um, easel um, is is really all I all I do is just get it to easel and then go through you know what what um, the maker makerverse guys um, walk you through to get exported out of easel to your um, um, G code. Okay. Yeah, and, and I will that's really helpful. Said, Thank you. What I just said is probably forty hours. Um, of experimentation to get to that point. <laughs> so if you're that's on what I'm looking to save speed, myself. That's, yep. <laughs> yeah, that's. But if you're not SketchUp, then I, you know what 
what Chris I am. Just described. I love SketchUp. Oh, that's amazing. Yep. Thank God. I'm so glad to hear there's another SketchUp guy. I could tell you a lot more, but I don't want to uh, um, take everyone's time. <laughs> it's just there's still much more to learn to get from working in 3D to working in what is really essentially 2D. You know, you could maybe call it two and a half D, but yeah. Um, Absolutely. It, it, yeah. it is it is a 2D plane with a, a depth. So it's, it's really cut, cut this line and how, how deep do you want to cut it? Um, I did post in the chat um, in, the, in the meeting, if you are on um, your computer, uh, I posted the link to Inkscape. So Inkscape actually has updated their, um, their software to where they are now compatible um, up to 10.15 Mac OS, uh, which uh, is a lot of the, a lot of the new versions. Um, so you can, you can download that. Um, they have a lot of uh, tutorials. So Inkscape is basically a open source version of Adobe Illustrator. It does the same, does the same thing. So you can, you can draw things, um, you can export a SVG. Um, they also have the learning tab um, that has uh, quite a bit of tutorials for like basic shapes, um, doing, doing outlines and everything like that. So once you have an SVG, then you can go into Easel. Uh, Easel is a online uh, free CAM software that is made by Inventables. So the people that make the X-Carve have this, this tool. Um, we just have not gotten to a point where we're making our own CAM software yet. So we are, we do everything that we can to try and help users uh, save money because we are all about promoting the ease of access to, to technology. Um, so if you have Easel, once, once it's, you make, you, you go to the import SVG flow. Um, and, oh, here we go. There's a random SVG. Uh, and then when you open that, uh, so it'll ask you uh, based on, you know, so an SVG will have size um, to it, but SVG is just a sc scalable vector. So right. you can leave it original um, and then just kind of like zoom out um, and then apply some scaling and then scale it down and then you'll move it. And then when you get back in there, um, there's your, it'll give you a uh, preview. And then when you select it, you just have options of, of what you wanna do. So like this is set to a pocket cut. So all it, it's going to remove all of the black area from, from, the, uh, from the material. Cutting on path means obviously it'll, it will mm -hmm. cut out the shape. Um, and then you have the, your cut depth uh, is where you can, you can change um, all right. of those, yeah. all of those values. Um, and then in here is where you would set your material um, dimensions, uh, your, your bit, bit size. Obviously we don't use the inventables bits. Um, so you just use the other and then type in the, uh, the dimensions after you have everything set the last step. And we have some, we have some documentation and some YouTube videos around this, um, to make it more Maslow M2, um, friendly, you will move the midpoint of this to that zero, zero location. Um, and then you'll go to machine advanced, generate G code, export G code. And then when you export the G code, it takes on whatever name you gave the project. So if you don't have a name, you'll end up with a bunch of these untitled G code files. Mm -hmm. um, but then that's, that is the absolute quickest way to get going is with easel. And if, 
um, SVG creation is not a thing that you are um, proficient at or you, you have some things that you want, um, you can get on a, a quick Google of pretty much anything you're looking for with SVG in the, in the search and, and you can find a, an abundance of SVGs. Um, the great thing about SVGs too is you can nest them. So like if I have, you know, I want to make this, but I want to have like a car underneath of it. I can go find the S SVG of the car and I can just do a, a another import yeah. and then I can assemble that, um, that project that way. Cool. Um, Thank and, you. That's and, really uh, helpful. Absolutely. And if you look on our, so the Maker Made uh, CNC YouTube channel, we have a um, like project creation series um, using both Inkscape and Easel to, to set up some projects. Hey, Chris, I have a question if you can hear me. Yeah. Um, this is Terry. Um, the, uh, when I'm in MakerBase and I'm cutting some, something, uh, I found that, that my depth of my cut, even though I have it set up in easel, sometimes I'm noticing that my depth of cut isn't quite cutting all the way through for whatever, for whatever reason, I, I, there's like a little burr or something on my, on my uh, waste board or something holding it up. Mm -hmm. it, is, how do I go in and, and make it so that it's a, a little bit deeper cut? So easel has some safeguards put in place that will prevent you from having a depth of cut that is greater than the thickness of the material. Um, so that the easiest way to kind of fudge that in easel without getting into that easel pro is just, just add um, a couple millimeters, okay. not a couple millimeters, you know, like a, a tenth of a millimeter yeah. or something to your th thickness. One thing to keep in mind though, is that if you are going to do that, when you get into your cut depth, so say I do a cut on the outside um, and then I go into my depth. Once the depth reaches the actual thickness of the material is when I have an opportunity to generate those tabs. Um, so if you're doing tab generation, you'll just wanna make sure that you compensate for that, that extra oh, right. thickness um, in your in your height of your tabs so that you don't end up just doing a full through cut and your piece falling. Yeah, that makes sense. But that that is a good one. But if you consistently see yourself being off, um, I would say to look at the calibration, the, the Z axis calibration in, in the Makerverse itself. Yeah, okay. I'm also a, a SketchUp guy. I do my 3D printing in SketchUp and uh, and the uh, M2. Nice. Very cool. Yeah, I haven't. Man, yeah, I haven't used SketchUp in a while. I used to do a lot of cabinet design um, and furniture in in SketchUp because they had a really cool uh, cut list plugin and uh, and like material spec. Uh, but I haven't. It's probably been a few years since I've even opened the application. Uh, would would definitely love if if any of you guys have the capacity or desire to do any kind of like tutorial or walkthrough on, on setting some stuff up in SketchUp for use on, on the M2. Um, we, would, we would definitely love to share that content with the other users. Do any of you guys use Fusion 360 for CAD and CAM design with M2? I just downloaded it uh, three days ago, so I'm getting ready to. I'm and, in the same room. <laughs> and, and I've downloaded uh, Blender for uh, 3D sculpting. Um, I haven't tried that yet, but that's a free program that uh, nice. can do uh, sculpting. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think Mesh Mixer is another good one on uh, 3D, 3D printing. I use that a lot if I'm slicing up a larger file and I need to segment it or you need to do, you know, retouch some surfaces because there's too many polygons or something like that or if you find pinholes. Um, but mesh mixer is another good one for that. Um, I, can, I can weigh in on the fusion 360 question. Um, 
when I said I, you know, probably had 40 hours into research and development of my own um, workflow. Um, one of the paths I went down was, uh, you know, looking at, okay, Fusion 360, uh, you know, that's the way to go. Apparently, you know, I can do the CAD, I can do the CAM and um, take it all to the next level. And I did the same thing Terry did. I downloaded it. Um, I spent, you know, an hour going through tutorials and said, oh, my God, my life is not, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just no way. This is, let me go back and see if there's any way that I can make SketchUp uh, do what I need to do. And thank God, you know, I, I just got, I found the uh, Faber guys who they are uh, some CAD guy, uh, some uh, CNC guys, some like full on production uh, CNC guys who wanted to get from SketchUp to you know, full on professional production CNC. Um, so that's what they were doing, but kind of, I think as a little side thing, they did the export to SVG. And um, so anyway, I, I, I circled back around and found that I will probably be able to live within SketchUp, the, the SketchUp to SVG to G-Code um, workflow for quite a while before <laughs> I have to uh, yeah, entertain yeah, a future in the Fusion 360 side. It's just mm -hmm. uh, scary. Yeah, it's very overwhelming. I, I got it a couple days ago and started playing around with it. And I did it because I used the, uh, just a simple easel to do a test cut of like, you know, an address sign. And uh, it kind of had some weird features around some of the lettering that I think was probably mostly an artifact from easel. So I thought I would give it a try and infusion and see if it did a better job of the cut path. Um, Cause I cut a box out around the whole thing and that was straight as a whistle. So it must've been some weird thing with the font and how it was telling it to cut possibly. Um, you'll see some in easel with the SVGs, uh, especially if you're doing anything with a, um, a radius, mm -hmm. uh, where there, there are different, uh, kind of like resolution levels of, of mm -hmm. an SVG. Um, and so you'll, you'll find some of them when they scale, will add kind of like, like pixel steps to hmm. the corners uh, mm -hmm. which will which can cause kind of a, a jagged and a, a way that you can tell that it was the svg file itself is mm -hmm. if you see if you see the router kind of like walking around a radius instead mm -hmm. of actually just taking it in one good sweep mm -hmm. um, then you know that that was something something that is not clean in the SVG itself that caused yeah. those additional um, tool paths to be generated. Yeah, I had two capital T's or a lowercase and a capital T and it put like a widow's peak <laughs> in the <laughs> middle of the top line of the T. And I thought it was the first was maybe my, my calibration and I put a box around the whole thing to cut it out and that thing was almost perfectly square. So it must've been something in that, in that. Yeah. Uh, some, some of those where, where when those, um, and this is kind of getting more into the graphic side, so I apologize if I'm kind of rabbit holing. Um, when you have two overlapping items in <clears throat> say like Illustrator or Inkscape, if you just take that and you export it as an SVG, those mm -hmm. intersecting paths are still there. Um, mm -hmm. So if you select everything and you say expand, um, then that actually combines all of those into just one set of paths or one polygon. And then that just makes for a cleaner cut because there's not those hidden paths and all of the overlaps mm -hmm. from the original shapes. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, that this, this is, this is good. I, I, I'll probably, we'll probably set a, a one of our Thursday meetings uh, with the agenda to just be specific to file creation, if that would be of any uh, interest to, to everybody. And then we can just kind of go through um, and do, do some live, live files um, in, you know, like Illustrator, uh, Inkscape, 
even building native and easel and everything. Um, but I do want to touch circle back on the Arduino stuff uh, for, for Clay. Uh, and then anyone else that's interested. Um, so obviously I already have this downloaded. So re downloading it again isn't, isn't going to do much for me. Uh, one thing I will point out, if you are a Windows user, I do not recommend this Windows app um, option that says 8.1 or 10. That's going to push you to the Microsoft um, work uh, app or whatever they call it. I forgot marketplace or something. They have like a weird name. I think they call it marketplace so that they don't sound like Apple and they say app store. Um, that, that I found this version. I don't know if it doesn't get updated as frequently, but it, I have struggled with getting that version to work properly for me on windows. So I always just download this windows win seven and newer option. That'll download an actual, uh, I don't know if it's an MSI or just an executable, but it'll download a Windows bundle for you so that you can get it installed on, on your computer. Um, they also have, they have the web editor. Uh, again, it's something that does work. Um, I just, I prefer to have an actual installed application and not, not rely on internet connectivity and cloud services to be able to use use that. So if, if you have, you know, if your shop is offline, um, you don't have Wi-Fi or something like that, then obviously having this, this Arduino application itself installed uh, would, would be good. Um, so once you have that uh, installed, um, you'll go into the Arduino uh, application. Hey, look at there, I have the, have the do software already. Um, and then so under tools, you'll see board. And then when you go to end of boards, you'll want to select if you do not see this right here, if you do not see Arduino do programming port or Arduino do native. If you don't see either of those, then you will need to go to boards manager. Um, if anyone is following along and wants me to slow down just please let me know and i will I, I, I think you mentioned earlier that you should not have makerverse open at the same time is that should i close both programs and reopen the arduino uh you can just close you can close makerverse uh if you like uh if you're on a mac make sure you do an actual quit and not just closing the visual window because uh, it will it will stay the uh, connection services will stay running in the background uh, if you if you don't do if you don't quit the application. Um, so in here you'll go to the boards manager. For some reason, it didn't actually open for me. There you go. Um, so you'll see in here, and then you can just type in SAM, um, and then you'll see that the SAM boards. Now, you want to make sure that you're getting SAM boards and not the SAM D boards. Those are those are different. That's you can see that they have the MKR um, and IoT stuff, uh, and in this SAM boards, uh, you'll see it. It will actually it will say Arduino do. Um, when you have that, there'll be an install option. Um, it'll take a little while to download. I can't remember exactly how many megabytes it is, but that'll download. It will install into your Arduino environment. Um, it doesn't make you reboot uh, Arduino or anything like that. Uh, and then a good way to tell that it is in there is then when you go to boards, um, you'll actually see uh, those Arduino do options. Now, the um, the M2 controller does everything through the programming port. So we won't actually we won't use the native USB. We'll use programming port. So that that right um, uh, USB port. So some of you with the older M2 kits, like the initial release versions you'll remember you had to do like the little case modification. Um, 
modification is definitely uh, a very kind term. Um, you, had, you had to cut the box. You had to break it. You, you know, let's let's be honest. Modification is 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 a very marketing term for what you had to do. Um, you had to, had to cut the case so that you could op get access to that programming port. Um, but that's the that is the port that we will select. Um, I. I'm at my desk here. I'm, I'm kind of digging around. Oh, here we go. That's a do. Now I got to see if I can find a USB cable. That is. My kids always come in my office and steal them to charge their phones. <laughs> All right. Oh, where? Oh, where? I was setting up my Arduino do. Uh, I had an issue on my Mac where it wouldn't, I had to use a different USB port on my computer. For some reason, it just couldn't, it couldn't find it. So then I switched it to a different USB port and it found it and it worked fine. He said we need to plug into the Arduino do programming port is what we need to connect to. Yeah. Well, no, the, uh, on, onto my Mac, the USB port. I had a, for some reason. It, oh, you tend to move around. Yeah, yeah. Chris's audio. Yeah, I can't hear him. So what was he saying about having to modify the box to get to the USB plug on the the original boxes um, had the, the cutout in the wrong spot, so you couldn't access the center uh, port. Oh, geez. Still can't hear you, Chris. I guess he can't hear us either. Then. It appears like it. I, I, his video came in. We lost his audio. You're making him a sign? <laughs> That's, a good idea. That's what I was going to do. <laughs> Yeah, we went through this process last night, and it, it's it's definitely a little, a little convoluted. Is it backwards? No, that that reads properly. Okay, it's backwards on my screen. Can you hear us, Chris? Last week, I couldn't connect to Zoom at all. I don't know what the problem was. Kept, yeah, I was having some issues last week as well. Kept logging in, and it kept bringing me into my own meeting. <laughs> Can you hear me now? 
Yes. 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 Uh, yes. Okay. When I plugged my little adapter in for the for the USB, it switched all of my audio over to a a USB hub. I don't I don't know. Zoom is just the most intelligent application. <laughs> okay. So roll since I didn't hear any of you either. Um, were there any questions that came up before we got to where I am right now? I think we just needed to see the how you navigated the GitHub. I think this is where I went last night to do this, but just okay. making sure. So so quick just, question to that point. Uh, once we installed the do board um, and you go into your tools to select it, do you need to select the programming port? Yes. Okay. okay. That. All right. So the programming port is what we run through. Um, and that is the, uh, I, I can turn my camera back on now that I, okay. That is this one right here. So if you have a newer M2, that, that port is, is properly exposed. If you have an older M2, um, there was a, a document where there was a manufacturing error and this one was exposed and you had to cut it to get to get that one open but this is the programming port um so you'll connect there um a good and also a way to tell so once you have it plugged in and you have arduino do selected um when you go to port you'll see it pop up that says arduino do programming port when you have it connected uh and your computer can see the board so then when you select that, I hate how it, when you select it, it makes the menu go away, which is dumb. Um, then you can go back and you can click on get board info. And then you'll actually see, it'll say Arduino do programming port. And then that is just a confirmation that your computer is in fact connected to your, um, your board and it, and it does recognize it as an Arduino do. You don't have hmm. to. You don't have to do that. That's just like if you want to check your work and say, okay, everything is set up. It's connected. Confirm that I am in fact connected. Um, this will give you that information. That way, if you see any issues on the firmware upload, we know it's related to the firmware itself and not your connection to the board. So um, this isn't the proper name on board info, but the vid and PID numbers matched yours it just says unknown board does it say arduino do no and when i went to the ports it just said com3 but in my makerverse that's the name of the com connection that i use is is your makerverse still open it is not okay um that should you should be okay um we will be able to test that theory um, <laughs> quickly though. Um, so on the GitHub link uh, for the Maslow do, I believe that, yeah, so that you can get to that um, from the, the link, the makerverse.com link. That is right here. Um, so if you go to makerverse.com, and then you go under the machines deal. There's our Arduino do link um, to the GitHub. Uh, and I, I put that link to the, to the actual machines page uh, in, in, the, in the chat uh, earlier on in the meeting. Um, so when you're on this page, the way that you can download the software or the firmware, sorry, is this code button. If you click on it, there's gonna be a little window uh, and you want to do the download zip option. So when you download the zip, it will download it. Um, to all my Mac friends, you can just say open and, and you're done. Anyone that's running a Windows machine, you need to make sure that you actually run the extraction. One of the biggest issues that we see with people updating firmware on a Windows machine is that they'll double click because Windows is weird where if you double click on a zip file, it'll show you what's inside there, but you didn't actually unzip it. So when you open it, you'll see like a little thing at the top that says extract all. You wanna make sure you do that um, or, 
therefore you will have you will have errors. Um, so when you have everything extracted, then you can go into the folder um, and then you want this Maslow do folder here. And then inside of Maslow do, this is where you see these, this is all the firmware here. Um, the one we're looking for is this dot INO with the little green icon. Double clicking on that, it will pull all of these other files with it. So if I double click on this, of course, it, there you go. Now that's gonna just, it knows that Arduino is how that file is to be opened. So it's gonna open this in, in um, Maslow or Arduino, golly. Um, and then you'll see, if you don't see all of these other files at the top, then that is a good indicator that you are on a Windows machine and you did not extract all. Um, so this is where this is where we are at. I have the new firmware open, um, and I have my board connected. And so the next the next step would be you can do you can click verify the little check mark, uh, and you'll see where it says compiling sketch. Verify just checks to see if there is any errors in the firmware file that you have before it tries to upload it. Um, and then so see where it says done compiling. I didn't get an error. That means this firmware is, is good. And then this little arrow pointing to the right means upload, which is, doesn't always make a lot of sense to me. So then you'll click the upload. And then you'll see it's going to go through its uploading um, process here. Let's see if I can get this moved up. And then you'll see. I think I have an error. Okay. Um, and so now it's verifying. I get all of this in the window at once. And then you'll see this, it'll say verify successful. Um, and then right here, you'll see a message that says done uploading. So at that point, I am, I am done. Common, common um, issue here is people will see the done uploading and they'll go straight to Makerverse and they'll leave Arduino open that will cause a uh, connection error. So when you're done here, you don't have to eject or, or, or you know, click any buttons. You can just close out Arduino. Um, holy cow, I just got stuff everywhere. And then you can go to the Makerverse application. Now, um, probably running a older version of, of Makerverse because yeah, I'm on 1.1.1. So, but now, now that I'm in Makerverse, I'm, I'm in the newer version. So 1.1.2 will look very similar to this. Um, you want to select Maslow and then your, your port is that Arduino board. So you should very similar to when you were in the Arduino application. And then baud rate is the 38400. Once I have that, I'll hit connect. You'll see that it does the firmware. If you get to this point right here, you're good. Your firmware update was successful um, and the Makerverse application knows it. Then you just need to type in a workspace name. Um, so we'll say, I'm just doing this to do it. And then you'll say create workspace. Now everything will go through, it'll set up everything. And then you'll get a little tab over here. Um, that is that workspace. Obviously I have a bunch because I, I, I do this. I walk people through this a few times. Um, that's and then, what 
that's what threw me off when I first started this up is I, I only had uh, two buttons over here, the house and the settings button. And there was a button in the middle that was blank and there wasn't, I didn't realize that that was actually even a button. Um, oh, I had that as well. And that, uh, that confused me. So it, it just to let everyone know. Gotcha. Yeah, me too. Is My that button's still blank? Can, yeah. Is there a way that you can take a screenshot and send that to me? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I really apologize. I got to jump off here for another uh, another meeting, but um, this has been extremely helpful, and we'll, I'm definitely going to jump through these uh, processes. And are you guys doing this call again next Thursday as well? Yep. Every every Thursday. Great. Uh, well, I'll probably jump on and let you know how it goes then. Perfect. Uh, really appreciate the help, and nice nice to meet you guys. Hey, no problem. All right. Take care. Uh, yeah, and I apologize. I know this was scheduled to run through 1230. So if anyone, I don't want anyone to feel obligated to stay on. Um, I, I have a habit of running over when I lead these meetings just because it's, you know, if I have information that somebody needs, I, I want to make sure that everyone has the, the resolution that they're seeking while, while I'm on the call. Yeah, I think we all appreciate that. This uh, this Zoom meeting uh, whole thing is just so beneficial. At least it, it was to me. I've, of course, I only signed in uh, once before, but having someone to be able to talk to, you know, like with any tech support is day and night. I remember the old days where you had to, you know, go by and look at the manual and spend hours and days trying to troubleshoot a simple question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely wanted to have that follow on support where you can talk to a real person that that makes these, you know, I, I make, I work on the, the software itself, I work on, um, you know, the designs for the M2Z axis and stuff. So we want, we always want the users to have access to the people that are making the applications and the hardware so that you you can get the answer from the person that actually put that button there uh, versus you know somebody that read a tech article and is in charge of support now so we 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 build all of our stuff in house and we support all our stuff in house and so that that's definitely something that um, we want to protect is is that perception of getting quality support on the products that we sell. Hey, Chris, I got a quick question for you here again. Yeah. Was I supposed to extract this into possibly the, the installation file for Makerverse? Uh, the, you know, firm, the firmware? Yes, sir. Uh, no. So I am, only... I'm getting an error on verification saying that there's no directory under the name CSTDINT. Okay. Would you like to share your screen? Sure, yeah. There we go. All right. Okay, so can you go back to the where you downloaded the um the firmware to? your zip folder yeah sorry i just did the application let me fix that screen share real quick oh no you're fine so i just extracted this into downloads because i'm lazy <laughs> oh no that's that's fine so i got the do master and then I went into the uh, Maslow do and then ran this program here, Maslow mm -hmm. do .io. And I definitely don't see what it's asking for in here. The CST DINT file. I mean, is that a, a file you guys have in your Maslow? 
do oh. fold. It's looking for a couple of other types here also that I don't see. I don't have a math.h or an int type.h. Yeah, so that is. Those are all going to be. Those are all going to be issues with. Um, those are all going to be issues in the Arduino software itself. Um, yeah, because CS2. I was optimistic. Um, so when, yeah, when so go, go to your boards. So go to tools in yeah. Arduino. Uh, so go to board. Oh, 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 OK. OK, so, so it's you're top three, but it added this. I checked this before I ran it, and it did correct the that, name. That is why. OK, so hit OK. Uh -huh. So go to tools yes. and go to, go to board. So see, you're still targeting an Arduino Uno. So, oh. go, so go go to there and go to do programming. Right there like that? Yep. And then now now run it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I only changed the port on it. So now so so that that CS CST D I N T, that is a that is a do board specific gotcha. um, item. Okay. Man, I never would have found that. It op when I clicked the .ino file uh, mm -hmm. in the master, it opened a new Arduino uh, yeah. window, and I had to reconnect the port, but I didn't think I needed to change the board as well. So perfect. All right. So now you are done compiling. So you should hit. You should be able to click upload now. And then we know it's going to compile. So we are on to the flash. So if you see any issues here. Then that, mm -hmm. that would actually um, be an indicator of an issue with your actual board. But you're on the verify stage, so um, no issues uh, Should be there. Good, yeah. I'll keep an eye on it. All right. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. <laughs> this yeah, is no, really a pay grade for this stuff. I've always welcome. wanted to into Arduino stuff. I actually have one sitting in a box somewhere that I told myself I would figure out and I never did. So this is a, a good crash course maybe. Yeah, and luckily this is gonna be just, kind of, this will be the, not gonna say the only time, but this this firmware, <laughs> this this will be the, um, the main time that you would need to interact with that with our controller is so that you can switch to the 1.1.2 .1 um, application. And then in mm -hmm. a future a future release of Makerverse, we are going to add um, the firmware support capability, mm -hmm. so that if, if you need to update firmware, you'll be, you'll be able to do it just by clicking a button in, okay. in Makerverse instead of doing all of this. So it looks like it did it successfully. It says CPU reset. So now I can just close yep. Arduino. Yep. So you just close and Arduino uh, completely. Uh, make sure that any you know any instances of it are closed. I know you said when you click the INO, it opened another Arduino window. Um, so, so make sure both of those are closed. Um, and so all of Arduino is, is, is exited. Uh, and and, and then, you install the Makerverse 1.1.2. Do I need to uninstall the other one prior to that? Uh, yes. Okay, so I'll need to go to add, remove programs and take it out. So we'll go here, and then in the latest release, then that puts you back into a, a GitHub, but you can actually download the executable. Oh yeah, I grabbed it while, um, we, were, okay. while we were talking about physical setup. Uh, it should be good now. Do I need it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was going to ask too. I mean, I guess, is it pretty common for you guys to have problems when building your wasteboard with unlevel floors? 
Um, it depends. So if you're assembling it on an un on a unlevel floor, then your frame will be equally unlevel in parallel to your floor, which mm. should not introduce uh, any any errors. Um, but if you if you want to like if you're using the wall mounts, then I would start with your waste book. Not do not don't start with your waste book. Start with your top beam and then making that level and then you can kind of compensate for it when you are doing your wasteboard and then just make the top of that um i mean i probably i probably wrestled for an hour with my wasteboard trying to get it level uh and um realized halfway through that i I'm in the garage, so it's on a grade to let water out of the garage. So I ended up shimming it with door shims. Yeah, no, that'll 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 definitely work. I, um, I just feel like a terrible temporary solution because if, <laughs> if there's any vibrations or anything, maybe it'll end up. No, absolutely. To... You could run a uh, like a like a support or or like a like a I don't know, jack stud is always what when you're framing um you, you can just take a piece of two by four um mm -hmm. cut it towards like six inches or something and then place it on the side of that leg where where your shims are and then and then run it run some screws into the side of your frame and then that yeah that would... at first i'm just going to take some scrap wood and make little feet out of it but i i don't know i was i was almost wondering maybe i could go get some of those adjustable uh, le uh, leg screws for chairs and tables. And then maybe if I needed some fine adjustment later on, I could actually. Oh, absolutely. Uh, that would, that would definitely work. It is really will just come down to, you know, how pretty of a solution and, and what your, your long-term plans for it are. Yeah. You know, I mean, I guess my goal right now with just getting it, I've only cut small things out, which with pretty good success, um, for the accuracy. And I really think my, my weakest link is the software and the cam processing. Um, but I just want to make it as accurate as possible and just kind of get it set and I don't have to worry about it as much in the future. Absolutely. Um, do you, are you guys able to use, I've seen guys use V bits on, on here before, uh, mm -hmm. On YouTube, do you guys, I mean, do you get success in carving with a ball end bit? Yeah, you can, you can definitely, you can use a ball nose. Um, so the, your bit selection is, is, is really up to you. Um, what you are going to run into with some of the software for the G code creation is if you're, say I'm using the free version of easel, those, mm -hmm. those paths are not going to be optimized for a V bit or, mm -hmm. and they're not going to give you like the preview. So what you'll need to do on, on, if you want to run a V bit and use easel to generate the, um, the G code is just knowing how much of a, of a V you want. So on, on the bit, it's, I wish I had a V bit right here. Um, obviously the deeper you go, the, the wider the, the valley, that you're creating is right. So, so knowing what your target width of that valley is is what's going to dictate your your final um, cut depth. Mm -hmm. Now they have some V bit software in, in Easel Pro that makes some of those calculations a little bit easier because mm -hmm. it gives you like a preview. But basic, you can you can do some pretty basic math to compensate and, and know what your final mm -hmm. debt is going to be. Um, mm -hmm. And then you can just use a, a general, a, you know, a basic cut path with a V-bit. The, the biggest thing that you're gonna see with a V-bit is that's where those crisp corners are gonna come from. So mm -hmm. when you have people that are cutting out a lot of lettering and, you know, I'm using Times New Roman font with the T's and everything, a V bit is how you actually get an mm -hmm. actual sharp edge corner on your lettering um, instead of everything being rounded over when you're using a, a regular bit. 
Um, ball nose, if you want to do something that has a, you know, a little bit of a concave, um, you know, obviously rounded over uh, edge in your corners instead of that, that sharp corner when you're using a, uh, a flat uh, mill, uh, you, can, you, can definitely, uh, you can definitely do that. Um, I'm checking with easel. I feel like uh, there, there are some ways that you can run uh, like multiple passes. So you could do, the, the big thing that I would say with a ball nose is if, if you're gonna hog out a lot of material, mm -hmm. I would not recommend using the ball nose as the first, the first yeah. pass. If we're roughing or, or uh, before you get into carving, you should do just a, a end mill, okay. Yeah. And then so yeah, the, that the the big interest I had with the uh, the V bits was actually for bending the plywood to to make shaped structures, and I was thinking I could cut slots on the backside of something down to maybe the last ply of the wood uh, at oh, the yeah. right V and and bend that. I don't know. Absolutely, well, absolutely. On that first, but hey, uh, real quick, I I fired up the Makerverse. Uh, I had to make a login because I didn't have one yet. But now I'm to connecting a machine, and it has Maslow Do and Maslow M2 as an option. Is there going to be a difference in which of those I select? The um, what were your Here. options again? Here, let me just show it to you. I mean, these two are the same for me. Uh, well, okay. So this is the this is the difference. So we sell the Maslow Do controller by itself. Uh, gotcha. Um, okay. So if you have the actual M2 kit, then you would yeah. select the M2. Perfect. Um, and then your sled, you'll say a standard 18 inch circle. Uh, and then you have that firmware. And yeah, I have this. That's already yep. installed. I just do my port, and then you can hit connect. There we go. There's the there's the sing song siren call right there. <laughs> Perfect. So then I need to create a workspace. Yes, and then that's where you can you can change the name. Yeah. Um, to whatever you want, and then the uh, so the icon is you can set the. Hmm. I have to figure out what's going on with that. Yeah, I found out that the icon is, uh, if you don't do anything, it just leaves a blank box up there between your house and your settings box. Gotcha. It gave me, it gave me an option somewhere. I don't remember now. Uh, yeah, it upward. should should be like a little maker made M. So I'll, uh, something something fishy. We'll, make, we'll get that cleaned yeah. up in an in a update. Looks uh, like now, it's now that connect automatically box, that uh -huh. is going to say anytime if you open Makerverse and you have uh, your your computer connected to your M2, it will just take you. It will just open up in your workspace. You won't have to hit the connect button. Sounds good to me. Um, now, have you have? Okay, now one thing to point out: updating the firmware does does delete all of your settings that were on there. Yeah, so, I figured I'd be starting over. That's not a big deal. Uh, uh, I wanted to do it anyway, since what we discussed, I'm gonna, I'm gonna drop the home by an inch. That'll, okay. That should get me to the 18 inch offset. Perfect. Uh, and and then make I, me, obviously make sure you do not uh, hit any of the jog controls before a home right. is established. Right, I made that the first time. <laughs> you have a runaway train. Yeah, you almost hit the ground on me. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, let me put this guy to sleep so I don't keep buzzing here. I have one last question before I got to get off. Uh, okay. Is this a new machine? Um, you Ooh. have. Or so have you? you in, yeah. I have, so, yeah. So that's, so that, yeah, that the answer to that is yes. And then what this is going to do is it's going to, it's going to do some prep and then it is going to push you into the calibration process. 
that okay. is um, there you go. And then so. Oh, cool. So you guys have a tutorial. That's great. Yep. OK, awesome. Well, I'll go through this here in a little bit. Um, let me. Uh, well, I guess I can't get my video over there to you guys. I guess my last question is I've got a pretty crappy shop back for my dust collection system right now. And I'm a little worried about the uh, the sawdust getting on the racks. Uh, on the rails, on the Z-axis controls, and on the ball bearings. So mm -hmm. I was trying to think of a way to reduce that so I could continue cutting without having to upgrade my my dust collection yet. Do you have anybody ever make a choke? So you have that small, I think, a two-inch diameter hole where the bit goes in. Uh-huh. Is the sled. Do you have anybody ever make an adapter to reduce the size of that so you can increase the, the suction? Yes. So... Um... We have, um, I don't know if you have a 3D printer or access to one. Um, Not yet. We, we, have, we have some files to 3D print adapters. Um, mm -hmm. And there are also, um, I think some, there's some, I know there's some members on the owners group that have printed adapters for, mm -hmm. for others. Um, and I want to say it might be on like, I know on Amazon, they make just like a piece of tapered pipe that you mm -hmm. can, that you can get. And then essentially you would just find which sections of that taper meet your, meet your needs. And then, and then cut that, that section out. Um, as far as dust collection, if you have a, um, a shop vac, one thing that you may look into is a putting a cyclone attachment on it. Hmm. Um, you can get those at Home Depot. It's just like a little bucket, and it has a has a V insert. Um, mm -hmm. And then what that cyclone will do is all of your sawdust will actually be captured in the cyclone, um, yeah, so getting, that so that you're not pulling any of that dust against the filter on your shock mm -hmm. back. Uh, and it'll actually increase some of the suction power that you have. You have a, a lot more consistent pull from, okay. from a smaller shop vac if you run it through a cyclone. Yeah, that's what I use on mine and it works perfectly. You don't have to worry about the filter ever getting clogged. Yeah, that's. I think I've lost some, some suction already for that. Um, okay, is there a place I could get maybe just a, a picture or the, or the modeling for that cover um, that goes over the center hole? Do you have a link to that or is that... The, uh, I mean, like I'm just thinking like adapter. Puck. Yeah, I'm just thinking like a hockey puck almost that's going to have a, a smaller hole in the middle of it for the router bit. Oh, 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 okay. You're, that's what you're, okay. Sorry, I was mistaken on which piece you were talking about. Um, so what is the absolute easiest thing to do for that um, is if you go to Home Depot or Lowe's, they sell little small squares of Lexan and plexiglass. Yeah. Uh -huh. they, all, they also have a cutting station where they can cut it for you. So if you make just a small square uh -huh. of that Lexan or plexiglass and mount it right over that hole, and then mm -hmm. you can just, you can just, I think it's, it's like a half or three quarter inch hole so uh -huh. that your, so that your collet can go through there. Okay. Um, then you will have a, uh, it, it's not really a zero clearance because, because it has to account for the collet, but you, you will, you will definitely have less dust flying out of that, uh, that bit hole, middle hole in the sled. Yeah. That's a great idea. That's way easier than what I was thinking of doing. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, Hey, uh, thanks again, Chris. I appreciate the support. I'll have to run this guy back through the calibration but i appreciate all the help i gotta run okay um but thanks again i would have i would have destroyed this thing trying to do that firmware update myself man so <laughs> hey no problem thanks a lot all right i'll talk to you guys later appreciate it bye yeah. hey chris i just have one quick uh, newbie question for you for sure um in uh when i if i haven't done it Use O in and let's say I have something that I want to cut out, but 
uh, on one path, I want it to just be a, a V bit, but then an, another path, I want to cut something out. How do I go in and change? Do I do that in easel where I can pick each path and select, okay, this is a cutout, this is a, a depth, and this is how deep, and, uh, and what about changing the bits We're in the middle of a, a run? Yep. So I think some of like the multi-bit stuff is more of like the, the easel pro um, settings, unfortunately, uh, as far as the passes go. Um, but I do know that this right here, so if I select, let me see if I can isolate. Yeah, so I know on individual letters, you can select the, indiv the individual letter. Correct. So it's all going to be down to how your SVG is made up. So if your SVG is made up of multiple layers, then you'll be able to target different lines inside of that SVG. So whereas this SVG is one single layer, anytime I click on this path, it's going to, it's going to get everything. But if I did it as separate layers, then I would be able to get like just this little group right here. And then I could mm -hmm. change that to a pocket. Um, and then I could target other things. So as long as you have independent lines in your SVG itself, then you can target them independently and give them different um, depth settings and cut styles. But will the machine stop uh, so that I can change the bit out in between? So if you're wanting, so if you're wanting to do different bit types, um, that is 100% possible. Um, currently, Easel has that behind the paywall of Easel Pro. Um, I know, were you one of the ones that, that said you're using, looking at Fusion 360? Yeah. So Fusion 360 has a post-processor that will allow you to set up um, multiple uh, bits and then it will run a tool change command. And then so it'll run its pass and then it'll move the sled somewhere and it'll stop. And then you can turn the router off, change your bit and then resume and then it'll move on to that next path. What is that process called? Um, it's just a, a post processor. Post um, and it'll be, it'll be in like your, your, your tool path setup. Um, so you'll have you'll be able to actually generate separate tool paths. Um, so it would be, it'll, it'll be under uh, tool paths and tool change okay. um, in, in Fusion 360. I'll look for that. Okay, and then there's also a Maslow uh, post-processor for um, Fusion 360 also, so that it'll, it'll actually tweak some of the settings um, to make it more uh, Maslow and M2 compatible. That's in Maslow or in Fusion? That's in Fusion. It's, okay. a, it's a plugin that you can oh, install. Plug okay. okay, great. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. I appreciate your time. Hey, no problem. And we'll see you, uh, see you next uh, week. All righty. Thank you.